In this video, we're going to be talking about entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. Now, what's important to understand for entropy is this right here. It's the measure of the amount of disorder of the particles in a system. So, I like this one right here, entropy seminar, because <laughs> things just get worse because they're more disordered. But what I like about it uh, is, well, it's very strange, first of all. Um, but it might actually explain the direction of time because it's irreversible. So it's going to explain a little bit about the second law that uh, entropy increases. We'll see that later. But also, it might even explain like, you know, what life actually does. So we actually increase the entropy. So uh, a nice pro tip here, just remember this, that warmer objects have more entropy. Because remember, there's more sort of random motion in warm things than there are in cold things. So this also has to do with temperature as well. So let's look at this equation, actually. So we have uh, these equations for entropy themselves. So we have macroscopic, which means for sort of larger objects, things like you know thermal energy and temperature. We'll be comparing that to, for example, microscopic in a second here. So first of all, we have this equation right here. It goes like this. The delta S, so the change in entropy in a system, is equal to the change in thermal energy divided by the temperature. So this is in your data booklet. Hooray. Um, but there we go. So what are the units? Well, change in entropy, we'll have to look at this in a second here. So change in thermal energy, thermal energy is in joules. Temperature should be in Kelvin. So does it make sense what's the units for entropy then? Should be in joules per Kelvin. So see, you don't have to memorize all the units. Sometimes you just figure them out based on the formula. So hooray. Now let's look at this one right here for microscopic. So instead of being a delta S like before, this one's just equal to S, so that's the entropy equals, and it's just Boltzmann's constant yet again, this time times the natural log of this ohm here, or this omega. So uh, this omega, so this is times a natural log. So uh, what do we do about this here? What does this mean? For, well, first of all, hopefully you understand this uh, Boltzmann's constant, that, that's at least one you've seen before. Uh, entropy, well, uh, entropy is going to be in, again, joules per Kelvin. So we can write that one down at least. So that's in joules per Kelvin. Mm -hmm. And um, this omega is the number of possible microstates. I'm going to explain this now. So let's just say we have a box of particles here. So we have a bunch of different particles. They can, they're equally likely to be on the left side and then the right side. We're basically looking at how many different ways are there to arrange the particles in this way. In other words, when there's two on the left side, and let's see, there should be eight on the right side. So how many different ways are there of lining them up? So there are, for example, 10 ways to, to organize this first one right here to get this first one over there. So we'll do 10. But then, of course, there's... Once this one here has been over there, the, the different ways of, of getting a second one over there, there's only nine ways of doing that. So that should be, you'd think it should be 90. But I'm going to write this down though here. But those particles are indistinguishable. So we have to divide by the number of ways that you can order them. So in other words, in this case right here, two. So that means I'm going to take my 90, divide that by two, and I end up with 45. So the number of microstates then, I can say that this omega then equals 45. So that's how I would, for example, uh, solve this one. Now, there's another way of doing it. You could, depending on which math class you're taking, and if you've learned about this, you can use combinatorics. So this is something, for example, called, for example, NCR, for example. So if you remember uh, ever doing that stuff, now if you've never learned it, don't worry, then just use this method up here. But otherwise, I just want to show you how this actually relates to for example, NCR. These are factorials, by the way. So in this case right here then, in this case right here, we would have 10C2, because we're looking at how many different ways are there of, or, of uh, organizing, how many different combinations are there of organizing two from 10. So in this case right here, we would say, well, first of all, it's 10 factorial. So it's 10 times nine times eight times seven, times six, this gets a little bit boring. Once you've done it a lot, you skip all these steps right here, but it's okay, I just wanna show you everything. Times two, times one. All that is divided by, let's see, R factorial, which is two times one, that's what a factorial is. All that times N minus R, well that's 10 minus two, so that's eight factorial. So eight times seven, times six, times five, times four, times three, times two, times one. And what's nice about these factorials, what happens then, if you've experienced these before, well, you'll see that, hey, look at that, the 
8765 cancels out this one right here, which is nice. So you have 10 times 9 divided by 2. So to see you end up with the same thing right here, you end up with, well, 10 times 9 divided by 2, which is 90 over 2, which is 45. So it still works. So just to show you, uh, now, if you don't know this method right here, no worries. You don't have to worry about this. And, uh, for example, this bottom one here is combinatorics method. Um, because you're not given this formula on your physics exam. This is actually for your math ones if you have it. But I'm just trying to make the link at least to combinatorics in case in your math class you've learned it. Otherwise, you just have to think kind of carefully about how many different ways are there of arranging these, for example, 2 from 10. So let's talk about now the second law of thermodynamics. And there's a few different formulations. There's the Clausius version, the Kelvin version, and we'll do the entropy version as well. So the second law really is all about, uh, well, energy can't be transferred from a lower uh, temperature to a higher temperature unless work is done on the system. What it really means is just energy doesn't like to go from cold to hot. For example, if I had, you know, a, I don't know, a cup of hot chocolate, for example, in my hand, uh, and I'm sitting in a room, there's no way the hot chocolate's gonna get even hotter, for example. Like the hot chocolate's gonna get colder, right? Cause it's gonna go from, you know, hot to cold. Uh, the Kelvin version of it, for example, second law is that energy can't be extracted from a hot object and transferred entirely into work. What it really means is that there's no such thing as a heat engine, then it's 100% efficient. So for example, you can't have perpetual motion. There's always some losses due to friction and other things. And finally, the entropy version, and I think this one right here is uh, my favorite version, at least as it relates to entropy, of course, is this one right here, that the entropy increases over time, overall. So that means uh, on a grand scale, the entropy of the universe goes up. The amount of disorder goes up. You know, the energy, for example, of the universe spreads out. Now, does that mean that you, uh, you always have to have that happen? No, no, no. Sometimes you can have, for example, uh, over here, you can have entropy decreasing, sure. I'll explain that later, but we can go a little bit deeper here. Entropy, remember I talked about before how it's related to the arrow of time. Well, that's because entropy is not reversible. Most processes in physics are reversible. You know, if I do something one way, I can reverse it and do it the other way. But entropy, no. It seems like it's a one directional thing. And because of that, um, a lot of people, at least within physics, like to tie entropy to the direction of time, because time also seems to be something that we can't reverse. So we think that entropy, which is irreversible, might very well be related to the sort of direction of time. And another way to just sort of try to think about entropy is over time, lots of, you know, lots of different examples, but I'll just think about a Rubik's cube. If you've ever seen those little cubes, you just spin them around. I mean, there's only one way to have it solved, but there's, you know, <laughs> billions and billions and billions of ways for it to be not solved. So clearly it's, it's uh, you know, as the more you turn it, the more you increase the entropy. Same thing with like a sandcastle. I took this picture actually as my daughter uh, built a sandcastle uh, last year, for example. So I took a picture of it. But I was just thinking about this, that there's one way to arrange all these sand particles into a sandcastle. And yet there's like an infinite number of ways of them for, the, for them to be not arranged that way. In other words, you know, it falls, the water comes in, it sort of, you know, makes it all move around. Now, last but not least, so can entropy decrease? Yes, locally but overall in the universe has to still increase. So an example of that, remember I talked about hotter things have higher entropy, colder things have lower. So you might think, hey, what about the aircon unit if you have that in your house, for example? Yes, technically, I guess, because it's cooling, you're decreasing the entropy you know, right in front of that heater, sure, or that uh, aircon unit. But you gotta think about it, there's gonna be like a fan or a pump or something outside that's actually heating more than it is cooling. And you can also think about it, the electricity that you got to actually run this thing that came from a power plant and that thing used up more heat than you do actually cool so it's still works same thing with life what we do of course we take food for example that's pretty organized it's pretty low entropy what do we do we eat it we spread it out in our body as you know we re-emit it as heat all sorts of ways we life we are great at taking, uh, for example, entropy, like say like a low entropy orange, we break it up, spread out the energy, radiate it as heat. So in other words, we've increased the entropy of the universe. Pretty cool, huh? So entropy might very well be related to why life exists and actually the direction of time, but it's all just about the amount of disorder in the particles in a system.